Welcome everybody to this session on emerging, on drivers for emerging issues of animal, in animal and plant health. My name is Jan Schans and it is my pleasure to co-chair this meeting with Professor Guy Poppy. Um, a few words about the session today. Outbreaks of uh, new, uh, new pests and diseases of animals and plants continue to surprise us despite the regulations that, that are in place and the surveillance and early warning systems that are in operating everywhere. A recent example is the outbreak of the bacterium Silella fastidiosa, which, is, which was never seen before in Europe, but has been detected in um, southern Italy and recently also in Corsica and France, and which attacks a wide ra range of ho host plants and has been, has, held, has been held responsible for the death on a large scale of olive trees in south of Italy. There is an urgent need to better understand the occurrence of such outbreaks. And therefore, we not, we not only need to study the outbreaks themselves, but also the drivers for these outbreaks. And that will be the topic of this morning. So we will focus on the drivers of the outbreaks rather than outbreaks themselves. Now, please allow me to introduce myself a little bit. I am, since um, 2015, I work at the Netherlands Food Safety Authority on the, as, an, as an advisor on the um, risk assessments in production change for food and feed. Before that, I worked at the National Plant Protection Organization and as a senior officer for plant health. And I developed and coordinated the national surveillance program. I uh, coordinated the, the uh, development of research for statutory plant health. And I was involved in many pest risk assessments. And relating to that last topics, topic, I was a member of the EFSA plant health panel for nine years and served as a chair in its first mandate. Now I'd like to give the microphone to Guy Poppy to introduce himself. Uh, good morning, everyone, and I hope um, there's not many more coming who are stuck in the queue at the hotel um, trying to check out their bag. Um, my name's uh, Guy Poppy. Um, I think as the, is it, is it the case often these days, I have two jobs. Uh, one of them is a professor of ecology at the University of Southampton where I study global food security and uh, the, the, the other part of my job is working in the UK government for the Food Standards Agency where I'm the chief scientific advisor. Many of you might have heard Mark Walpert talk about the uh, the role of chief scientific advisors and, and uh, I, I work with Mark but, but specifically with issues to do with um, food. Um, as I don't want to take up too much time because I realise we've got a very packed um, programme but I, I just highlight that comment about what we're interested here is discussing the drivers and uh, I've worked um, on issues where we've used a thing called the Dipsear framework and the Dipsear framework is when you understand the drivers and pressures of something and then, then, then you use modelling and various other measures to look at what change of state or impact that will have, which we probably hear a lot about today and then you think about the R of the Dipsear framework, which is how you respond so how you either respond to that change of state or impact or how you try to think about changing the drivers and pressures. So that's what we want you to think about, the drivers and pressures. And without further ado, I'll introduce uh, William Koresh from, from the US. Um, uh, William has published uh, an amazing number of papers and had a very significant role in the world of animal health. But I think very importantly, he's also written a lot of articles where the knowledge is transferred and exchanged to wide audiences, including in things like the Huffington Post. So it's really nice when you've got somebody who publishes in the Huffington Post and 
in a large number of academic journals. So thanks over to you, William. There you go. Is that a little better? Thank you. You could sit a little closer, too. We're just talking about foodborne illness. It's pretty safe up here. If you want to move to the front, it's OK. Um, I w thank you to the organizers and Dr. Frank Bertha, particularly for inviting me to speak. It's really an honor to be here. This is a great group of people. I've been learning a lot in the last two days. And I hope um, I can live up to the expectations for the group here today. Um, but I do want to talk about some of the connections between animals and plants, basically landscapes, um, and our health. Um, the other title, of course, for this talk could be you get what you eat. So I think all of you in the room, and this because it is a food uh, group, you understand what this really, the implications of this. Um, just starting, you know, as a background, because I am giving the, the opening here for the session, um, we do know that emerging infectious diseases, of course, are on the rise. And this is not biased by um, discovery or reporting, uh, but they're really, if you correct for reporting bias, we still have an increasing number. Um, most of those you see in yellow in that increasing number are linked to wildlife, so I guess the good news, um, especially in the food side of things, is a very small portion, the green portion, are related to domestic animals. Doesn't mean it's not a problem, it's just a smaller percentage. So some of that I'll get into the reasons why, what's driving that. If you look at it another way, we just this paper just came out about a week ago, um, just a network analysis, this is about 300 and, 3,300 um, emerging disease events, or zoonotic events of viruses, and you see once again that kind of linkage between um, the network between wildlife and virus sharing with humans and domestic animals and wildlife sharing, um, excuse me, viral sharing with humans. Uh, so we kind of, looking at this in different directions, we kind of see this pattern still seems to be true. Now, why does this occur? Well, we know viruses, bacteria are constantly involving. The rules of evolution, um, the rules of ecology have not changed. The only change is that humans are really, anthropologically, humans have changed the landscape um, and provided evolution and ecology to allow these spillover events or diseases to emerge more easily. So we've really changed the playing field. Uh, the basic principles of biology have not changed at all. So when we do a breakdown of what does drive these, this is some work also that just came out this year, um, analysis of um, the first time viral diseases emerged um, and linked them with some of the classic drivers that were established by the Institute of Medicine. Uh, we see that land use change really is the largest percentage associated with where we see diseases emerge. Um, agricultural industry change um, is also a big driver of that. Uh, food industry change, which we thought was a bigger driver, is actually falls out a little lower when we do an objective analysis. Bush meat is also low, and I, some of you know me. I've worked with wildlife and hunting and disease emergence my, most of my career, and I was disappointed to see objectively because uh, subjectively, personally, I always thought bush meat was the most important thing in the world, but the data don't support my opinion on that. So I think we do have to be a little fact-based, but we, we do a, a good rigorous analysis. We see um, that certain things are associated with disease emergence and other activities less so. They can still be important. Um, we've kind of updated the hotspots model. I'll show you a little more about that. Um, but we have now in version two and three of the hotspots, which are basically a risk map for areas of the world, so we can actually identify places on the planet that are at higher risk of a new zoonotic disease emerging. Um, and we kind of show, you'll see here, the kind of the relative influences, so that's a boosted regression tree kind of analysis. So we see human population, of course, is the biggest factor, and diversity of mammals, and I'll explain a little why that is uh, the case. Um, but there's also a connection, once again, as we said, with land use change, in this case, kind of pasture, uh, change in pasture, cropland pasture. So this is an example of that, if you look over the last 100 years, of the change, and this is just a proportion of land devoted to pasture. Now, it's different in different parts of the world. I'll get into that a little. Um, so we see at the top is the original Kate Jones model, which we did, was done at EcoHealth Alliance. Um, 
lowering that, and you see it's kind of a rough scale. Um, in the new refined model where we've actually been able to add in other factors like agricultural change, land use change, livestock, you get a more refined map. But basically, if you zoom in, you just see that the fewer areas are of higher risk, which is kind of the good news because it lets us uh, target efforts for prevention a little more carefully. So the more honed in we can get at targeted intervention steps, the better off we'll be for the future. Now, what does that look like when we're talking about agricultural change? This is palm oil or oil palm trees. So this is for food production, but it's also used for other things. And this is going on on a massive scale, especially around the equatorial belt of the US, so, um, Southeast Asia, and in Africa now. So this conversion of forest for um, agriculture, in this case, oil palm. Um, and we're you know, curious and wondering about which diseases, new diseases, are gonna emerge as we move into these areas, or known diseases just re-emerging in some of these things. So we can see this pattern, but we know uh, from the data uh, that there's a risk. And why is that? Well, we have this drive for land use change, of course, to raise productivity, raise economics. So we have to find this balance between economic growth and health and well-being. So this is kind of the linkages and how we're connected there. If we de delve in just to foodborne EIDs, um, the drivers seem to change a little. Um, now we have fewer numbers to work with, and this is first time events. Um, but once again, it seems to be more linked to food industry change, which rather than the land use change, we kind of reverse this a little. Um, but that's where we're really targeting in direct contact, essentially, with foodborne illness. What this misses is where the food's produced. And so we know with globalization, um, we know that the sources of some foodborne illness are way upstream. So the driver that you might find in Berlin, Germany, um, is, might not have anything to do with land use change. Of course, that food could have been produced in Egypt or in someplace else. Um, so this calculation really misses that origin of the food source. I think we're underestimating the land use change here, but when we look at the bigger picture, we see that. Um, and also zoonoses, once again, and I'm, many of you are experts, you see that they're also comprising a large percentage of foodborne EID events, emerging infectious disease events. So this is the first time. Um, and most of the, a lot of these are bacteria rather than viruses, um, which is good news, once again, because we do know um, good ways to control these diseases. And I'll get a little into control in a bit. Now that's kind of looking at a global level, which is interesting, but not always useful. Um, so we really want to target down into um, things that are useful and practical that we can do something about. If you look at country level drivers, you see those little pies, I hope you can see that. If we could dim the lights, you might even see it a little better. Um, but in different places in the world, the drivers are just different. Um, and that gets us into intervention strategies or prevention strategies. There are also the different um, drivers, like land use change or ag industry change, are associated with different types of diseases and their transmission pathways are different. So you see with land use change, they're highly associated with vector-borne diseases, whereas with agricultural industry changes, they're diseases that are transferred either by contact, direct contact, or oral transmission. Um, so once again, it allows us to target in our intervention strategies. So where there is a large-scale change going on in land use, we know we need to do a better job with vector-borne disease control. So there's something we can actually do, control vectors. Um, in agricultural industry change, where that's occurring, where that's kind of affecting the landscape, we need to do things that we do in food industry, which is uh, reducing oral transmission, direct contact. So it has more to do with hygiene, sanitation efforts, and we can actually reduce the number of diseases there. So there's some practical guidelines. So I wanted to show you a little market. I took this video last week, and then I'm trying to drill down from that global view for you onto more on the ground, what the reality is around the world. So this is a typical day in a market. Um, I shot this video in Indonesia. The sound is gonna really be, could we turn the sound down on the speaker? Maybe. Well, bear with me. There's a lot of background noise because I'm walking through the market with my little phone, just recording. Um, so this is about a 90 second clip. 
we're doing great for time. Um, and I'll show you what a day in the life is for most people in the world, billions of people in the world, really. Um, and they, and of course, they can move around the world any day they want. These are dogs. Um, so underneath this table is about 50 live dogs. And the consumer will come and pick one out. Um, and they will then uh, slaughter it for you. And then they will eviscerate it for you. And then the, the, they're black because they um, use a blowtorch and they singe the hair off that. So it's not really sterilization, it's just they're getting the hair off the animal before the buyer takes it home. And then the offal, the intestines, the guts, are thrown on the ground and then other animals will eat that, so they'll feed that to the dogs or so. And then you'll see, it's a, it's a fun day at the market. And I'll try and narrate over this. So that's the dog vendor. And then back here, these are um, pigs. So it's a mix of domestic pigs, and then they sometimes have wild boars. Uh, so once again, they're cutting up processing animals. People are just walking around. That's just blood on the floor. Um, there are several thousand people in this market while I was there. I was just there for an hour or so. And then those are chickens. So they're live chickens, and they're also slaughtered there. Um, so they're spreading whatever they have. Uh, there's some more pork, pig, meat. Um, this gentleman is chopping it up with his bare hands, and here comes a customer's walking in. He's just using a machete to chop up meat, so that's splattering over there. You have some motorcycle riders are coming in. There's some more meat there. People are walking around in flip-flops and bare feet. They're using their hands to pick up the meat. These are um, bats, so those are large fruit bats, and the vendor there is cutting them. Once again, those are not cooked or smoked. They're just singed on the outside, so they're juicy on the inside. So when you cut them open, they'll eviscerate them for you, and then that viscera is just thrown. These are rodents for sale. They like to eat arboreal rodents. Uh, once again, the viscera is still intact. They don't remove it until you buy it. There's some pig, there's some people shopping. Those are snakes, those are um, pythons. So that python meat's available there. Um, and we'll end, I think, with a very happy customer on this little clip. Yeah, it's got her, her hands in the meat. Um, so that's going on every day throughout the world, um, mostly in the developing world, but if you look through Asia and then lots of Central Africa, we're having that contact. And once again, we seem to be surprised that we have zoonotic disease transmission or emerging event. It seems to surprise people every time. With Ebola, you're like, wow, how did that happen? Well, it happened because of this daily contact in large volumes. That does lead me right into Ebola. So this is a, you know, our standard way, of course, of dealing with emergent disease. You wait till there's a big outbreak in humans, and then you mount a, a massive global scale response team, which in the last case in West Africa was a little slow to get started. Uh, so we have tens of thousands of people affected and dying. That is one approach to outbreak, <laughs> um, dealing with outbreaks of emerging diseases. The other approach is, as we're talking about today, and you're going to hear more about this from our speakers in this session, which is a great session about prevention, understanding the drivers, is understanding that they're linked to what we're doing on the planet. So this is a logging camp of, there's for a, a legitimate logging camp owned by a European company um, in the middle of Central Africa, in the Congo. Um, and they build these very nice facilities and cut down the trees, and the trees are exported to Europe and Asia and the United States. We're a big consumer. Um, and the workers are provided some housing, but they're not provided with food. So they're dependent on that village here on the left, you can see, of people that move into this area, and they're hunters, and they're sex workers, and they're people selling cigarettes. So you have a little commercial business that grows up around every logging camp. And there's hundreds of these, and this is out working also throughout the tropics, and we are also surprised. But they have to bring in food, so the hunters go out and collect what's called bush meat by us, um, but it's just wild game meat. And it's a variety of species. So you see on the left, on the right there for you, um, is that gorilla, a piece of gorilla is being just sold in the market. It's a massive scale. It's about a billion kilograms a year just in Central Africa alone. So that's the wild meat that's being consumed. And once again, I always say, you know, we seem surprised 
when we have a disease transmission event that gets into people. Um, and the only thing that's surprising about it to me is that we're surprised. So really, this is a lottery. I think a lot of you live in Italy, so you understand the lottery system. So if you, built, if you bought, if you purchased a billion lottery tickets, if you were a virus and you want to jump from an animal into a person, and you had a billion chances, a billion lottery tickets, your odds are pretty good that every year you might win once. Um, so this is really just about statistics. Uh, and, we can, and that's why it becomes predictable. Because as you start to quantify what's going on, we can start to identify the higher risk areas. Now, they're rare events. But they just turn out to be very terrible, tragic events when they happen. So HIV AIDS has not been a good thing for our planet, but this is how it started. Ebola more recently, a horrible thing, this is how it started. SARS, this is how it starts. So you can do a lot of great mathematics, and I certainly am not gonna go into this in detail with you, um, but you can use this to start seeing, connecting those drivers with predictable areas. We can predict which airports are most likely to receive a case of an emerging disease because now we're globally connect, connected. So you say, well, it doesn't really matter that that market happens to be uh, in our remote island in Indonesia. Well, it does matter because people are coming in there every day and tourists are coming through and the next day they're in Singapore or the next day they're back in Europe or they're in New York City. We get millions of people to come through my town all, you know, on a weekly basis from all over the world. We did this just with Ebola last year, so we kind of know, we've kind of tested this you know, version. You can do the same for food products. This is done for humans. We just counted the number of humans moving around the planet on a daily basis, and you come up with just an odds ratio or predicted value for risk. So we did this for Ebola, saying which countries are at the highest risk for people moving once they got Ebola. Of course, Ebola started with contact with wildlife, that was the index case. After that, it was human to human, and people started moving. So Ebola is really a foodborne disease. People need to be really honest about that. Um, before it comes a hospital-acquired and a family-acquired disease, it starts as a foodborne disease. So we kind of ran the simulation back last summer, and then we watched the dates of spread, and it worked out pretty true. These models have worked. You can actually calculate the probability for movement, um, and it was ahead of time, and we saw that it identified the high-risk countries. And this, you can be agnostic about the reason why. It's just based on uh, travel data. You can do the same with cargo data. You can do the same with food commodity data. You can calculate a probability of spread based on these things. The other ways to look at it, we kind of analyze, well, which, which species, what are risky behaviors? What are we coming in contact with? Um, so once again, we, this has not been published yet, but Kevin Olive of Alika Health did it. And there's some work where you basically look at every pair between a host and a reservoir and a human virus, and which species share viruses. Um, and we came up with about oh, close to 3,000 of these mammal virus associations, which include humans. This is using all the published literature. And we kind of looked at which species, you know, seem to be higher risk. Um, so the number of viruses any given group of animals has is pretty consistent. Um, but the number of, the percentage of them that are zoonotic, which mean are shared with humans, is not evenly distributed. So some species seem to have a higher risk, have a higher proportion of viruses, this is just viruses, that are shared with humans, and other species don't. So we always wondered, is it a, a contact issue? Is it because we're in contact with 20 billion chickens a year? Is that why it's dangerous? When that kind of a case, it, sometimes it does overwhelm the system that huge numbers, but otherwise, it's really related to phylogeny, it's our genetic relationship. So what we see is a predictive value there, that the closer the species is to humans, the more likely it is we are to share viruses. So once again, we can narrow down a, what types of animals pose more risk 
than others. Um, in this case, you'd, you'd probably be surprised, but everybody talks about bats a lot, but bats are actually genetically more related to humans than many other species. So you kind of see it on the screen here. So we have humans and primates, bats, rodents, ungulates, hoofstock, kangaroos, and thus the platypus. We share very few viruses with the platypus. They're very far away from us uh, genetically. You know, they lay eggs and they're a mammal. Um, when we look at all of those, we can start to once again map them out and say, where in the world is this happening? I know, okay for time. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. I'm almost finished. Um, this is uh, the number of zoonotic viruses in every mammal ever reported. And we can map that out. And you go like, oh, that's interesting. There seem to be a lot in, a lot in South America, which you could say, okay, well, that's a risky thing. Once again, we want to make this from go from interesting to useful. So we reversed it and said, well, we can estimate how many viruses should be out there, but they're not reported in the literature. So we did the predicted value minus what's been done, what has been studied, and we see um, the places in the world that are basically understudied. So we think there's a lot of more to be done in these places, whereas other, some places in the world have been heavily studied and oversampled, which you see in blue. There's been a tremendous amount of research and publication done. And then red, which is hotter, is the areas that have been basically understudied based on the predicted uh, estimate of the number of viruses that should be out there in animals. So once again, for you, you see in Europe, especially towards Eastern Europe, there's a probably a lot lurking there that has not been studied, or if it has been studied, in some cases, it's never been made available to the public or published. Uh, so we have two versions of our lack of knowledge. We know a lot of work has been done that was never released uh, for security reasons, or it's never published, or it's published in a language we have a difficult access to. Um, or it's just not been studied. So my guess is for Eastern Europe, some of that's been done in the past, probably 30, 40, 50 years ago, but that's not readily available, um, or it hasn't been studied. And I think that belt across Central Africa, uh, we still have a lot more to discover because there has been little work there. A lot of this we can start looking forward. I know we're not actually talking much um, about climate change, or at least I'm not today, but we can use the same kind of modeling to project where the potential risk is. This is done out for 2050 um, for distribution of Nipah viruses. So once again, Nipah, it's a bat-borne virus. Um, it infects humans, it infects pigs. There's a couple of mechanisms. Um, it is a food-borne illness at its heart, um, and that's how it's transmitted between animals and from animals to people. Um, and then on the ground, we can really zero in. This is a project we're just doing in South Africa. So that's the study site there. It's about 40,000 square, um, excuse me, 40,000 yeah, square kilometers. Did you say that was larger than Belgium? And Holland, it's larger than the Netherlands. So our study site's larger than the Netherlands. Um, and we're looking at Rift Valley fever in a multidisciplinary way. So we can actually, we're trying to drill down into the drivers. So we have teams studying domestic animals, wild animals. We have entomologists doing mosquitoes. We have a human uh, component where we're testing humans, but we also brought in medical anthropologists. So they're doing human behavior to see what the risk factors are for Rift Valley fever. We have eco vegetation ecologists because where the mosquitoes lay their eggs and where the larvae survive during the dry season is very linked to vegetation and also soil quality. So we have a whole team of soil scientists evaluating that. And then we're linking it in with climate. We've established about 20 weather stations with the National Weather Service and then training South Africans. So we have a kind of this integrated approach so we can tease out what is driving this Rift Valley fever outbreaks, what goes on um, between the interepidemic period also. So we have a comprehensive look um, at the ecology of just one disease uh, to start to figure out some of these mechanisms. So just to close up, and say we have, um, I think of this all as biological threat reduction. Uh, so emerging diseases, foodborne diseases, I don't know, vector-borne diseases, whatever you want to call it, you know, from an ecological perspective, um, 
in a human anthropocentric perspective, which we're concerned about the threat to us, in the big picture of ecology, we don't really matter. So it's not really a biological threat except to humans um, and to animals and to plants, uh, the things we care about, and that's why we call it a threat. But we still need to figure out and delve in that detail. What are the practices? What are the behaviors? What are we doing uh, that's generating risk? I think we're getting a better handle now on where they're more likely to occur, but we could be a lot more specific so we can target interventions. Um, what's going on is linked to that behavior. Um, and then some questions about host biology, uh, resistance, and a big one that I think is coming on the horizon now is about tolerance. It's not really resistant diseases, but we have a lot of mic our microbiome. We pick up a lot of organisms, and we just tolerate them, and we're happy with them. We don't resist them. And so I think there's things we can learn about um, infectious organism tolerance that could help us in some of this prevention if we can understand those mechanisms um, and get more into prevention, detection, and response. So what I keep seeing is we have to work upstream, and I think the food industry is, is probably the best at this. They probably understand this more, that preventing disease, controlling food disease, um, disease transmission is best done at certain control points along that pathway instead of waiting till it gets down to the ultimate, to the consumer. Um, and we need multisectoral collaborations, and we need to engineer our policies uh, to reduce risk and impact. So what I mean by that is we need to design science-based policies that are really designed like we do for earthquakes. So we know where on the earth we have earthquakes, and we have our engineers and architects that drive the, the policy to make sure the buildings are built in ways that they don't fall down. So we can build those into policies and engineer that system in. We see it in the food industry because you set standards for control to reduce disease. Um, and we need to apply that more broadly for the whole host and range of diseases. So with that, I'll close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's an absolutely excellent uh, scene setter. And uh, we're quite keen to have a very comprehensive discussion at the end. So I'm prepared to take two questions that are quite specific to this talk, but don't... Um, OK, we've got, we've got one there. Hi. Uh, good morning. I'm Maria Vitale from Instituto Zooprofilactico of Sicily, Palermo. Uh, I would like to know, I, I came in just a little bit later, so I don't know if you address this, this point. There is a, some uh, relation or something that can be important the, with the um, natural parks or natural fields that are uh, related to a more po possible, possible transmission from, uh, um, of zoonotic disease from uh, mammals to humans or from wild animals to humans. I'm thinking about the, the maps that uh, you show also, about uh, all the literature that is present uh, for the South America and the less literature that is present in Europe, then uh, it is also like two different uh, uh, mm, uh, uh, environments. I mean, it's more human in uh, Europe and less, more wild in uh, South America more natural park, more uh, biodiversity, more uh, mammal species, all this kind of thing. Yes, it's highly linked to biodiversity. Um, but I think that was corrected for, so it's more about proportionality. But you, in some places in the world, you'd be surprised by the biodiversity of Eastern Europe and the Black Sea area and some of those areas. You'd be surprised if you really took a walk in the woods um, there's a lot of diversity in, of animals there that we take for granted. And a lot of people say we don't have bats in our country, um, though they probably have 50 or 60 species, but they don't go out at night and they don't see them flying around. So I think, you know, just what we observe is different than what's really there. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think we'll, uh, we'll pick Move up on. questions like that towards the, the end.